Good evening, everyone. I am calling the St. Louis County Council meeting to order Tuesday, September 7, 2021. The hour is 6.30 p.m. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America. Republic, which it stands, nation under God, indivisible. With liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Right. Mr. Clark, please call the roll. Councilmember Days. Here. Councilmember Dunaway. Present. Councilmember Fitch. Here. Councilmember Webb. Councilmember. <laughs> Councilmember Clancy. Here. Council Member Trachis. Present. Council Member Harder. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. I do not have my cards here with the order uh, that we will be discussing the and voting on. Thank you. The voting order this evening will be C, Clancy, Fitch, Days, Harder, Trachis, Webb, and Dunaway. Thank you very much. Um, the journals of the meetings of August 17, 24, 27, and 31 have not been finalized. So we will move over to uh, bid openings, which we have none this evening. We will move to communications. Madam Chair, we have no tax compromises this evening, so we'll move to zoning matters. Under zoning matters, item number one. Receive and file, and that will be the order. Item number two, third district. Receive and file. So ordered. <clears throat> Item number three, fourth district. Receive, file, and the county council will be directed to prepare the appropriate legislation. So ordered. Item number four, sixth district. Receive, file, county council will be directed to prepare the appropriate legislation, please. So ordered. Item number five, sixth district. Receive file. County Council will be directed to prepare the appropriate legislation. So ordered. Madam Chair, we're moving on to other communications. Under other communications, item number one. Receive and file, and that will be the order. <clears throat> item number two. Receive file, and the County Council will be directed to prepare the appropriate legislation. Same motion will apply to item number three. Item number four, third district. Receive file in the deposit agreement and subdivision plat be approved as recommended. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those aye. aye. No. Motion carries. Item number five, fifth district. Receive file and the county councilor be directed to prepare the appropriate legislation. So ordered. Item number six, sixth district. Receive and file, please. So ordered. Item number seven, sixth district. Receive and file. So ordered. Item number eight. Receive, file, and the county council be directed to prepare the appropriate legislation. Same motion will apply through item number 10, and that will be the order. One moment, Madam Chair. Item number 11, seventh district. Receive file and the county council will be directed to prepare the appropriate legislation. So ordered. Item number 12. Receive file and the county council will be directed to prepare the appropriate legislation. The same motion will apply through item number 14. Moving on to public forum. Madam Chair, we have 21 speakers this evening. Right. Thank you very much. Um, this evening, when you come, uh, give us your name and your zip code for the record, please. Uh, we have um, had good meetings so far, so let's keep it that way. Let's be respectful of each other. And when you applaud, you know, curtail your applause because what you do is cut down on the time for somebody else to speak. So I appreciate you doing that. And uh, with that, we will have the first speaker, Mr. Clerk. Our first speaker, Madam Chair, is Elizabeth Cohn, followed by William Hermanson.
Hello. Hello. It's loud tonight. Elizabeth Cohen, 63005. A vaccine is a medical product. Mm -hmm. Vaccines can cause side effects just as medication can. Are any of the council members who must vote on mandates infectious disease specialists, epidemiologists, immunologists, internal medicine specialists? Notice I did not ask about anesthesiologists who don't treat COVID patients. I hope you at least have read the data on the vaccine X adverse events reporting system or VAERS. Do you understand the risk from the COVID vaccination for each person you are threatening with loss of their job if they don't get vaccinated? Before COVID, groups like the CDC and the WHO did not get involved in an individual's medical care. It had always been between the patient and their doctor. There's no room for government in our medical decisions. The chart I handed out shows the deaths from COVID vaccine versus all other vaccines from 1990 to present. This data is from the VAERS system. It shows that there have been 13,627 deaths from COVID vaccine in the last 18 months. Since 1990, combined, all other vaccines have been the cause of only 8,879. I shouldn't say only because that's still a lot of deaths, but less than the, the COVID vaccine. Including death, there have been over 623,000 incidents of adverse reactions to the COVID vaccine. Clearly, the COVID vaccine is not without risk and is not safe for everyone. Most of us who haven't gotten the vaccine aren't conspiracy theorists. We just realized there's not enough data showing that the potential adverse effects of the COVID vaccine outweighs their risk of serious illness from the virus. The messenger RNA shots received emergency use authorization, not approval, just four months from the beginning of their phase three trial. In the United States, Pfizer's trial um, only included 30% of people of color, 70% were white. Since only half get the vaccine and the other half get a placebo, 6,900 people of color and over 16,000 white people received the vaccine and were watched for problems. Do you feel that is long enough and with enough quantity and diversity of participants for you to safely require the vaccine in order to be employed? This is the stuff you need to consider. After all, you, are, you essentially are giving medical advice by mandating the vaccine. What if someone who only got it because of the mandate has an adverse reaction? Who do you think they'll blame? Only 3,000 kids aged 12 to 17 were in the study, equating to 1,500 who actually received the vaccine. Most shocking to me was that they were only observed for a month before approval was granted. Those are not big enough numbers for me to take the risk with my healthy young son. I've been weighing the risks versus benefits of medical procedures for my kids, along with our pediatrician, for 22 years, and I'm not going to stop now. The FDA working list of severe adverse effects from the COVID vaccines um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, Bell's palsy, blood clot in lungs, inflammation of heart muscle, inflammation of heart membrane, meningitis, inflammation of spinal cord, encephalitis, convulsions, seizures, stroke, paralyzation, brain bleeds, anaphylaxis, autoimmune disease, pregnancy and birth outcomes, Kawasaki disease, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, vaccine-enhanced disease, death, Madam and several Chair, more I can't pronounce. Minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corrin. The next speaker is William Hermanson, followed by Jackie Jean. William Hermanson, 63011. Our civil rights were violated in November 2020 when our election was stolen from us by foreign interests. There are 19 bellwether counties in the United States that have accurately predicted the election outcome since 1980, some of them since 1964. The demographics of these counties are such that they're very representative of the nation as a whole. In 2016, Trump won all of them. In 2020, he won all but one, and that one, Clayland County, Washington, has some obvious real problems of election integrity. There are four states that since 1896 have been 100% accurate in predicting the election outcome. These are Iowa, Ohio, North Carolina, and Florida. Trump won all of them in 2016. He won all four of them again in 2020. Primary voter turnout is also an indicator of election winners. Primary voters are more dedicated voters. A strong predictor has to do with turnout. Four incumbent presidents who ran in a primary and lost the general election were Hoover, Ford, Carter, and Bush, 41. Bush had 72% of the turnout. Three incumbents who won the primaries were Eisenhower with 85, Nixon with 86, Reagan with 99. They went on to win landslide. In 2020, Trump's primary turnout was 94%. 
These are just three examples out of 10 I could list where an analysis of voting trends <clears throat> indicates Donald Trump won the 2020 election. Now we find prima facie evidence of illegal activity by Dominion Systems in Mesa County, Colorado, where server records were deleted in violation of federal law. We know that China and others interfered electronically in our 2020 election. We know that over 3,100 counties were affected with vote switching. We know that 59,000 votes were switched in Missouri per testimony to the Missouri House Committee on Elections last month. We know that the only way to ensure election integrity now in the face of what we know about the fraudulent 2020 election is use of manual ballots without electronic connections. Scanners that do true tabulation could be used for rapid vote results, but certification should only take place with paper ballots. Voters will not go to the polls in Missouri in 2022 without knowing their votes are secure. What is St. Louis County doing to protect our voting rights? When the public very soon demands that electronic voting equipment be scrapped, what is the plan you have in place? Thank you. Our next speaker is Jackie Jean, followed by Joel Harrell. Jackie, 63074. I have here the FDA approval letter submitted August 23rd, 2021. You can find it on the FDA or Pfizer's website. Go read it for yourself. On page two, quote, on August 23rd, 2021, FDA approved the biologics license application submitted by BioNTech Man Manufacturing GmbH for community, end quote. This vaccine is not currently in production or labeling processes in the United States. Quote, FDA is reissuing the August 20... August 12, 2021 letter of authorization in its entirety with revisions incorporated to clarify that the EUA will remain in place for the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, end quote. So the Pfizer COVID vaccine is still under emergency use authorization and is therefore not approved as a vaccine by the FDA. At least four times in this letter, it states that the Pfizer shot is under the EUA and isn't approved. <clears throat> Page 11 to 12, quote, all descriptive print and matter advertising and promotional material relating to the use of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine clearly and conspicuously shall state that this product has not been approved or licensed by the FDA, but has been authorized for emergency use by the FDA, end quote. Now, in the middle of the letter, it says the ingredients of both vaccines are basically the same and that they are interchangeable. Their hope is to use up all the Pfizer EUA vials that are in stock and that people won't use do any further research. What they don't tell you is that community being an approved vaccine is not shielded from liability, meaning if you get that specific vaccine and have an adverse reaction, you can sue them for damages. However, the Pfizer vaccine under the EUA is shielded from all liability. So if you have any reaction, sorry, if you have any reaction to it, you have nowhere to go for compensation. For those of you in denial for adverse reactions, I'd like to give you some numbers from the openbears.com website. There have been a total of 650,000 reports submitted to this website since the rollout of the vaccine. All these numbers do include all three vaccines. However, Pfizer is the dominant one in adverse reactions from what I could tell. Again, do your own research. Almost 14,000 deaths, 1,700 miscarriages, 1,700 plus miscarriages, 6,000 plus heart attacks, 5,000 plus myocarditis, pericarditis, 18,000 plus permanently disabled. That's just a few of the numbers. These people will never have the life they used to have. They were doing the right thing, what every news station, political leader, paid doctor and nurse was telling them to do. They are now left with hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills, doctor's visits, some even surgery. My body, my choice. Each of us individually have reasons to choose to get or not to get these shots. Madam Chair, that's three minutes. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Joel Harrell, followed by Zena Hackworth. Hi, I'm Joel Harrell, uh, 
63123. I just wanted to check uh, and see how the investigation was going and uh, to Dr. Faisal Khan's uh, racial allegations. And um, if you want to sign the uh, recall Sam page petition, please go to recall sampage.org and somebody will get with you. And, uh, um, and how is the investigation going into Sam Page's violation of the county charter working to jobs? And uh, yeah, there is fraud going on in the medical community. I heard that uh, in the committee of the whole, and that's completely true. Uh, can you tell the difference in the way someone speaks who isn't CDC funded and who is? I did. It's very contradictory. You know, one person that was not brought to the committee of the whole was a behavioral health expert, like a psychologist or a psychiatrist, to talk about how this affects us psychologically. Uh, the shrinks are expensive. How many suicides were committed last week versus COVID deaths? We all heard the consensus that masks are only good for four hours. Is the county going to pay for 120 masks a month for me? I doubt it. This affects access to businesses, even if masks aren't provided. There can't be any deviation from the standard. The goalpost is always moving, and no one can agree on what a mask is. Oh, it's a piece of cloth. Councilman Harder, you are on the right path about the doctor culture. Doctors are afraid of losing their funding. <clears throat> Keep in mind, Washington University is a teaching hospital. They don't want to bite the hand that feeds them. Physicians are under threat of being ostracized from medicine or called a hack. I had a Washington University surgeon that disclosed that he worked for Smith and Nephew. I was fine with it. However, Dr. Babcock did not disclose that she was a she was funded by the CDC. It states on the WashU Infectious Disease website that she is a quote CDC funded clinical investigator studying transmission of infections in healthcare settings. She is a past president of the Society for Healthcare Epidemi Epidemiology of America and co-chair of the CDC's Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee, unquote. Uh, Council member uh, Lisa Clancy, I, I heard a rumor that uh, your husband worked on Sam Page's campaign. I hope it's not true because this would be a potential conflict of interest. If it is, you know, it's coming together now. Council members have been arrested for corruption all over the United States. I urge all council members to vote no on Bill 228. I understand that it has to be approved uh, by the police board, but this is a sign that it's an upcoming sign that we need to move. Madam uh, Chair, that's three minutes. Thank, thank you, you very much, Ms. Farrell. Our next speaker is Zena Hackworth, followed by Steve Cassily. Zena Hackworth, 63129. Madam Chair, we are not China, Cuba, Afghanistan, or any other totalitarian country. Those, country, those countries mandate their citizens while exempting themselves from such mandates. Councilwoman, Councilwoman Webb, you and every member of the St. Louis County Council is exempt from, the, from that bill that you're presenting tonight. So you can make a decision for yourself. You have decided that you all can make decisions for yourself, but the people who work in this building can't, or people who work in for St. Louis can, County can't, that they need you to do that. They don't need you or anyone else to make that decision for them. They have doctors that can make those decisions for them. They have their own uh, healthcare providers. They have their own people. They have themselves. They can make up their minds for themselves. Um, you have on your door, Council, uh, Councilwoman Webb, you have a sign that says, are our priorities about serving the people or serving ourselves? It appears to me right now, in all due respect, that you are right now with this bill about serving yourself. Because the people who work here in St. Louis County, they can make those decisions for themselves. You, would, you all are not supposed to be ruling by fear. Give the people the information they can get their own information and let them decide. If you want to do social distancing, fine. Do social distancing. 
but let people decide for themselves. COVID is here to stay. It's not going anywhere, just like the common cold. It's not going anywhere. No matter how hard you try, you're not getting rid of it. Just like the flu, it is not going away. COVID is here to stay forever. And you can't mandate any, you can't mandate it away. It's not going away. I was, I read earlier, uh, earlier this, earlier today or a couple of days ago, maybe sometime uh, there was a, an article near the end of August that mm -hmm. I was reading about Israel. Israel has one of the highest vaccination rates, upwards of 80%. Yet right now their numbers are skyrocketing among the people who are vaccinated. So please respect the people and respect their autonomy because all of you who like to talk about pro-choice, a woman has a right to choose what to do with her body. At what point are you going to going to realize that it's not just what you agree with? We have a right over our bodies. Men have a right over their bodies. Parents have a right over their children's bodies. We don't need your permission. The people who work here don't need your permission. Just give the people the facts and let them decide for themselves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Our next speaker is Steve Castley, followed by David Usher. Uh, Steve Castley, 63119. I have a uh, little broadcast I'd like to present. We are in the middle of a global pandemic, right, Jen Paisecki? And uh, our efforts to address the global pandemic. Wait a minute. Play that again. To address the global pandemic. Did she just say what I think she said? Did she just say pandemic? She, <laughs> she said pandemic. Huh. I wonder why Jen would say that. Well, sometimes old Jen accidentally tells the truth. Well, I'm sure she didn't mean to. In celebrating the FDA's approval of Pfizer's product, we went into the archives today. And it turns out in 2009, Pfizer had to pay the largest criminal fine in U.S. history for anything. The criminal organization had to pay a criminal fine of $1.195 billion. They had to pay a total fine of $2.3 billion which was inclusive of both civil and criminal charges. Now, if you're worried that Pfizer might have committed just one criminal act, you can put your concerns to rest because Pfizer admitted that between 1997 and 2006, it paid more than $2 million in bribes to government officials in Bulgaria, Croatia, Kazakhstan, and Russia. They had to pay a $15 million fine for this amongst its other infractions. Luckily, the public doesn't have to worry about Pfizer having to pay any more fines, as the company has no liability if the public is harmed in any way from its new product that was brought to market in record speed. It is worth noting, though, that extremist citizens who want freedom for themselves and their country are rising up against the passport system and winning. For instance, Moscow implemented the passport system and then banned it after three weeks. Why? Because citizens rose up and decided to boycott any business that required a passport, which got Moscow to reverse their decision. Israel implemented the passport system and then banned it because it simply wasn't working and it was dividing their citizens. And Denmark has announced it is banning all passport measures. If you would just go along with the restrictions of living with the passport system, then that's probably the final thing they'll demand from us, right? Microchips are coming to your arm near you. Take a look. And this is sort of cool. Scientists at the Pentagon are developing a microchip that can detect viruses in the blood, including COVID-19. The chip would be inserted just under the skin and alert the user if the coronavirus is present. It doesn't just tell your phone when you're sick. It tells the centralized authorities when you're sick to protect you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Next speaker is David Usher, followed by Renee Artman. Hi, my name is Dave Usher, 63146. I'm here to inform everyone that there is no epidemiological evidence 
that the Pfizer and other COVID vaccines are effective reducing either infection or death. That means the vaccines are not working when we've all been led to believe that they are remarkably effective. How do we know this? Epidemiologists warned us from day one that vaccines are not the magic bullet for rapidly mutating respiratory diseases. They're only effective against the virus they're designed to interdict. It only takes one mutation to render a vaccine expired. We can't make vaccines fast enough to keep up with the viral mutations. The vaccines we're using today were for the very first Wuhan virus, which has been dead since January of 2020. <clears throat> we're now dealing with 13 strains of the Delta virus in the United States with more mutants coming. Despite the nation being nearly half vaccinated, we are seeing higher infection and death rates than last year. These rates should be declining if vaccines are effective. The proportion of vaccinated individuals in hospitals also matches the percentage of vaccinated people approximately at any given time. This also tells us the vaccines are not working. This ratio is true in every field data set coming back globally, which a couple other people mentioned. Vaccines, now here's why the vaccines don't work. They only key in on one aspect, it's called an epitope of the virus or the spike. Vaccines are like a safe with only one number in the combination block. Think about that. Natural immunity creates both antibodies and T cells that key in on many aspects of the virus. It's like having a safe with 29 numbers in the combination. And T cells provide the long-term memory that should last a lifetime. Vaccines don't do that. Bill Gates gave a TED talk in 2017 insisting everyone should read the 1954 book, How to Lie with Statistics. This is why Big Pharma has been lobbing fake statistics at us since day one, beginning with the lie that COVID is much more dangerous than influenza A or B. It's time for the people to shut down quack medicine. As a non-lawyer analyst, I suggest that destroying the healthcare system by firing workers who are free to take quack medicine may be a prelude to years of costly lawsuits. The same goes for businesses who apparently may not have statutory authority to act as doctors with the force of government health agencies. We must do what settled epidemiologic science calls for. One, we protect the vulnerable. Two, we should not extend the flu season with hysterical lockdowns. An eight months long flu season gives the virus a lot of time to mutate and kill the vulnerable. Three, we should teach everyone how to decrease viral Madam access Chair, to that's COVID three minutes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Our next speaker is Renee Artman, followed by Greg Hudson. Good evening, Renee Artman, 63026. This handling of COVID 19 has been a disaster and an outrage from the beginning. Here is an example of a conversation and you'll find out why people are confused and angry. You can't come in here, why not? Because you're unvaccinated, but I'm not sick, it doesn't matter. Well, why does that guy get to go in? It's all right, everyone in here is vaccinated. Wait a minute, are you saying everyone is there is vaccinated? Yes, so why can't I get in there if everyone's vaccinated? Because you're unvaccinated. Oh no, they can spread COVID just as easily as un, um, unvaccinated persons. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. Never mind, I'll get my mask. That's fine. Now, can I go in? Absolutely not. I was able to come in yesterday with a mask. I know. So the mask is no good anymore? No, it's still good. But I can't come in? Correct. Why not? Because you're unvaccinated. So masks don't work anymore? Masks works well. So why in the heck can I get unvaccinated people sick if I'm not sick and masks work? My question to you, Ms. Dunaway, Ms. Clancy, and Dr. Sam Page, I'm assuming you all are all vaccinated. Why in the heck aren't you present here tonight? And why don't you come? Why aren't your people here? And another thing to you all, we've had 13 men and women die in Afghanistan. We have a hometown hero 
and you all could not even stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. That's outrageous. Next speaker is Greg Hudson, followed by Karen Smith. Greg Hudson, 63021. Good evening, members of the St. Louis County Council. My name is Gregory Hudson. I'm a healthcare system administrator in the St. Louis region. I stand before you again one week later, but this time on unpaid administrative suspension from my health system because I have continued to refuse to get weekly COVID testing. <clears throat> to this point, I have refused, refused weekly COVID testing for the following three reasons. One, on Saturday morning, August 21st, I received my lab results back that I was positive for COVID antibodies. My first reaction was one of euphoric bliss. That euphoria, however, quickly turned into a deep sadness because I came to realize that we are now living in a world in which we must walk around showing our papers. Only those who have received COVID vaccine actually have valid passports. There is growing evidence that acquired natural immunity from contracting COVID-19 is better protection against future COVID exposure than the vaccine itself. If I am asymptomatic, this positive antibody test should be my passport and it should count for something. Number two, it is becoming increasingly clear by the day that the overall efficacy of the vaccines wanes very quickly and lasts between three and six months. The CDC and Dr. Anthony Fauci have already indicated as such since they are beginning to propose that already vaccinated individuals may have to receive a booster shot every six months. In Israel, where they are already giving booster shots or a third jab, there are reports that some of those individuals are still contracting COVID um, and had to be hospitalized. These vaccines might help minimize the symptoms of COVID, but they are not stopping people from contracting and spreading the virus. As for a hostile and discriminatory workplace, when mandated COVID testing was implemented on Monday, August 16th in my health system, the following language was included in the fact sheet that was sent to all unvaccinated individuals. And I quote, to ensure an environment of safety effective August 16th, all employees, employed physicians, physicians in private practice and all allied health professionals who remain unvaccinated for COVID-19 will be required to receive weekly COVID testing until such time as they are fully vaccinated. I want to emphasize these last eight words, until such time as they are fully vaccinated. Does this sound like a choice to you? There were no criteria or benchmarks established as to when mandatory testing would cease. When individuals have received approved medical and or religious declinations, can you understand why language such as this makes an individual feel that they're working in a hostile and discriminatory environment? If you also consider that the above fact that the vaccinated individuals are contracting COVID and can spread the virus as easily as unvaccinated individuals. Healthcare institutions that are concerned for the overall safety of its patients and workforce, and not just the mere perception of safety, should those not be tested 100% of employees weekly for COVID-19, and not just those who are unvaccinated. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen of the St. Louis County Council, thank you for the opportunity to meet with you earlier today in the Count Committee of the Whole. Time does not permit me to review everything discussed earlier today, so I'll end my comments as follows. Hospitals across the St. Louis region, the state of Missouri, and the entire country are facing unprecedented staffing challenges. Before we wake up soon and find that our region, state, and country are in another COVID lockdown, and that our nation's hospitals are Madam once Chair, again forced. Madam Chair, that's three minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead and finish your um, sentence. Yes. Before we wake up soon and find that our region, state, and country are in another COVID lockdown, and that our nation's hospitals are once again forced, to suspend elective procedures due to severe staffing shortages, I beg of you to consider passing a moratorium on COVID-19 vaccine and testing mandates in St. Louis County. The cure has truly become worse than the disease. You have the opportunity in your hands to stop this madness and make a statement to the rest of the United States that these mandates are not the answer, and that we are truly a unified country of Americans and not one of two classes of citizens, those that are vaccinated and those that are not. Please do not tell the healthcare heroes of 2020 that they are now the healthcare zeros of 2021. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Our next speaker is Karen Smith, followed by Jason Moore. Um, Karen Smith, 63119. Um, I'm here tonight to just um, ask you to uh, take a stand to turn this thing around. We have been heading into a disaster for 18 months, um, financially and health-wise. And a lot of things have been done uh, that have brought a lot of money into the big picture. Um, this gentleman who talked about the reasons why the vaccines aren't 
effective. I sent a video um, to everybody, each council person last week to tell you that the, Ms. Dr. Christina Parks gave a testimony for the state of Michigan about this exact same thing. And you can go back and look at that and why it is discriminatory against African-Americans. Um, I think that um, we, we did stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge of Allegiance says that that we are committed to liberty and justice for all. And I think that what's going on is there, a, there is a lot of conflict. Um, if we are trying to pass laws that are not constitutional because you have taken an oath to follow the constitution and you have promised to uphold liberty and justice for all. So things that are dividing us are not helping. That is not your job. And that is what the people are fighting for. That is what we are fighting for. We don't want to be the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. We don't want, you send out a uh, survey asking if restaurants will set aside a section for unvaccinated people. Honestly, what does that do? What is that justice? That is not justice. That is not liberty for all. You're taking away our choices. That is discrimination. And the other thing is we're talking about these um, landlord versus rental and evictions. The Supreme Court struck down um, extending a moratorium. Why does the St. Louis County Council think that they can enact that? That is craziness to me. We have money. You talked about last week that we got $32 million of money. That is our money. That is from the federal government. We pay taxes. That is not, the, that is not like, let's hold on to that money. We need to get the money into people's, into these landlords' pockets into their make up for all the money that they lost we need to let the people stay in their houses but the landowners have to be made whole it's not that is not justice so let's stop doing trying to mandate things that are illegal or unconstitutional there are attorney generals all over the united states that are filing lawsuits against vaccine mandates and mask mandates there are our own attorney general is filing lawsuits of things that are against con our constitution. We need to look at our constitution. We need to look at what our what we have promised to liberty and justice for all and follow those things. We need to be a people who fights together for the same things Madam and protect Chair, that's each other. Minutes. Thank you very much. Ms. Our next speaker is Jason Moore, followed by Tom Sullivan. Uh, Jason Moore, 63021, everything she just said. <laughs> uh, so expounding upon the small business needs assessment, as a pandemic continues and the Delta variant spreads, we value hearing from business owners regarding your thoughts on how local government can be most helpful right now. Please feel free to share this forum with any small business in St. Louis City or County Responses are due by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, September 8, 2021. Thank you, Councilwoman Lisa Clancy and Alderwoman Christine Ingracia, St. Louis. One of the questions on here, are you interested in collaborating with other businesses on a requirement that customers must be va uh, vaccinated to visit your location indoors? What would you like to market? The, would you like to mark the number or percentage of your employees who are vaccinated? Are you interested in the ability to build out temporary structures to see customers outside in areas such as parking lanes? Would additional local funding allocated to small businesses be helpful at this time? If you answered yes to the last question, please provide information on what kind of funding would be most helpful, grant, loan, et cetera. What would you use this money for? So my, my question, Ms. Clancy, is this for Gladiator Consulting or Fenton Consulting that's going to get this money? Is, is now the, the county, the government, going to decide who's going to win and who's going to lose in this current business market? I cannot think of a better way to continue to rip apart our society. Well done. Now, the only other uh, real thing I have to say outside of what everybody else has already said, you already know very well my, my stance on uh, government coercion with vaccinations, masks, the whole nine yards, is where are we at with uh, getting off of YouTube? as our primary uh, conduit of uh, streaming our, uh, our county council meetings 
after the August, I think it, the August 3rd meeting and then August 4th, it was removed from YouTube platform for a violation. Uh, again, the Constitution of the United States of America allows us this platform to speak to our government. And I was chilled to the bone that that happened. Now, fortunately, we spoke up and got it back up. Uh, last night or last Thursday at our Rockwood uh, School District uh, Board of Education meeting, we were warned by the president of the board stating that we have to be mindful of what we say because YouTube has the ability to cent uh, censor our words. And I had to remind the president said, no, they don't. That is underneath the Constitution of the United States. YouTube is not that. So I would like to, to know where we're at with trying to find other solutions, including in-house, if that is what is required. And I would like a lawsuit levied against YouTube. And I would be happy to sign Madam my Chair, name to that's it. three minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Our next speaker is Tom Sullivan, followed by Greg Porter. Tom Sullivan, 63130. A couple of weeks ago, I was surprised to hear about the secret discussions to limit and restrict the speech of speakers at council meetings. The secrecy continued as a summary of the discussions as an unnamed author. It did mention that Councilwoman Clancy and Webb were involved. It should be noted that public comments were restricted at last week's meeting and were prohibited at two previous meetings. It seems shutting out the public has become a priority for this council. There are other matters I would suggest have a greater priority. It is getting hard to read or watch the news lately without seeing something unfavorable about St. Louis County. There was a story recently about a Chesterfield resident who had a flash fire on his propane grill, leaving him with first degree burns. His wife called 911 and was told the circuits were busy. Stay on the line, don't hang up, we will get you in the order we have, said the recording. She hung up, called again, and got the same message. A Channel 2 reporter was told that during peak hours, a caller might have to wait one to three minutes to get through. There was another troubling story recently. A St. Louis County police technician was charged with hiding a murder suspect for three days. The notorious St. Louis County Animal Shelter was in the news again. Channel 4 did a story about a family whose dog, Daisy, was at the shelter to be checked. When they went to pick up Daisy, they were told the dog was dead. Couple's daughter, who was close to the dog, was heartbroken. It was also mentioned in the story that the shelter lost a dog in July that still had not been found. A recent front page story told of St. Louis County paying more than $2 million this year to, quote, settle several state and federal lawsuits that allege wrongdoing by jail staff, police misconduct, workplace discrimination, and violation of Missouri's open records law. There have been recent stories about streets all over the area being flooded. Sewer district officials said the system's capacity was exceeded. Of course it is, as MSD has failed to address stormwater runoff problems for more than 50 years. County Executive Page appointed Amy Fair to the MSD board in 2019. She has now been on the board two years. She has been nothing but a rubber stamp. Stormwater problems don't seem to concern her. The same can be said of Sam Page. I would suggest that some of these problems might deserve more attention than trying to limit and restrict free speech at council meetings. Thank you for listening to my comment. Our next speaker is Greg Porter, followed by Tom Abel. Good evening. I'm Greg Porter, 63033. I have two subjects to address this evening. First, with regard to the perfection of bills for PC 1521 to authorize an amended C8 plan commercial district for the former Bellman Nursery for an indoor outdoor event space. I have some concerns about it, that. Number one, uh, adequate parking spaces on the property for large groups such as weddings. Number two, increased traffic as an event space with a much larger number of patrons as compared to when it was a plant nursery with much less, uh, much less traffic activity at any given time. The potential for violence due to large groups of people, which is a characteristics of some types of venues. The close proximity to a dangerous intersection at North Highway 67, Lindbergh Boulevard and Robbins, Road, Robbins Mill Road with only a stop sign for Robbins Mill Road traffic. The petitioner's uh, history on CaseNet with regard to lawsuits filed for the, against the petitioner for money owed and other lawsuits. 
Unfortunately, the CaseNet website was down today, so I couldn't print uh, a list or provide uh, any examples. I realize that this bill will be most likely passed in final passage, but I want to go on record with my reasons for opposition. I hope that I'm wrong and I don't have to come back sometime in the near future and tell you that I told you so. Secondly, I want to address the absence of the three musketeers at council meetings, Dr. Sam Page, Lisa Clancy, and Kelly Dunaway. I think you're all using the mask uh, issue as a convenient reason for, it, for not attending council meetings. You all wear your mask and are seated on the dais, which is well more than six feet from the audience. And as you, know, you knew when you took, uh, you'd have to spend time away from your home when you were elected. So stop the excuses and start showing up to represent your constituents as they expect from you. And for Clancy and Dunaway, hire a babysitter. One last point. One last point, which is a question for Dr. Page, whom I do not expect to answer me. At the July 27th council meeting, you took your mask off when you spoke, which was at the peak of the deadly Delta variant. As a medical doctor, you know how deadly this variant is supposed to be. So why would you take off your mask? Did you strike a truce with the virus to not attack you while you were speaking? As you should recall, this was the same meeting in which the infected man from St. Louis was in attendance yet no one in attendance at meeting was infected due to his presence. Thank you very much, and I'll leave a copy of my printed comments with the council clerk. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tom Abel, followed by Mark Passan. Hi there, uh, Tom Ablin, 63104. Um, my purpose in coming to you today is maybe to introduce some information or new ways of thinking about this crisis. I'm not here to waste anybody's time, uh, but I've been studying this, everything going on for about 30 years. And uh, I think what we are experiencing right now is a coup attempt. The people behind this coup hide behind many layers of illusion lies and diversion. The most glaring of these is the media, now owned by only six major corporations. A mere 25 years ago, there were 90 or more. Everyone in this room understands that there is risk and reward in everything we do in this world. It is how life is negotiated. If you step outside your door, there's risk involved. In this so-called pandemic, 99.8% of the people who actually get sick, the vast majority of us don't, survive. 99.8% survive. We have 80, 18 months to think about this. What is going on here? The real pandemic here is fear. Where is the rationality? The ultra-rich 1% through their proxies in the media are pushing for control with the use of fear. It has been a long noted, it has been long noted that to get people to do what you want, you must scare them. Every tin pot dictator who ever lived without exception scared the people. That's what they do. He who pays the piper calls the tune. We know that. We all know that. People see the world the way they're paid to see the world. That's a fact. How do I know this is true? What's the first thing people did when this pandemic broke out in March of last year? Folks, they went and they bought up all the toilet paper. Not too rational. Not too rational. The stores had to put limits on toilet paper so people wouldn't keep buying it up. The most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the minds of the oppressed. That's from Steve Biko, a guy who ought to know he was a South African revolutionary. Harriet Tobin said it even better than that. I could have freed more slaves if I could have just convinced them they were slaves. 
There is no countervailing force to the peddlers of fear except us. Madam Chair, that's three minutes. Except you and me. Except we, the people. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Our next speaker is Mark Pesson, followed by Matthew Shepard. Mark Paso, 63122. I am here before the council to propose and insist on more public service from the county health department. I wanted to bring in a box of Cheerios in here to further make my point, but apparently Cheerios have become too frightening to the public. <laughs> Had I been allowed to bring a box of Cheerios into these chambers, I would have been able to make something readily available to my fellow citizens in a way that is not readily available to the public regarding the vaccines, which is to say I would have been able to read them the ingredients. Why are we now nearly one year after the rollout of these vaccines being deprived of real information about the ingredients of the vaccine? Does Dr. Page and his director of health not know the ingredients of this new life-saving drug? According to the CDC, many, many people are having adverse effects, uh, reactions to the vaccine. Many of these adverse reactions, at least those that have not ended with the call to the mortician, appear to have been allergic reactions, anaphylactic shock and Bell's palsy being among the most prominent. Again, according to the CDC, this may be why so many doctors and scientists at the CDC and the NIH are opting out of getting their life saving allergic reaction. Allergic and adverse reactions are real and they are scary. It is therefore incomprehensible to me that the so-called director of health would not want to alert his fellow citizens of the possibly problematic ingredients and side effects that may accompany this life saving therapeutic. I therefore propose and insist that these ingredients be listed on the website and prominently acknowledged. Moreover, I ask the council members whom I understand have all gotten your shots. Aren't you a little curious, Mr. Trackus, Mr. Fitch, Ms. Days, just what it is that once was alien to your body now resides inside of it? And if you choose to be cavalier about such <clears throat> new materials coursing through your bloodstreams, as is your right and privilege as a certified adult. Aren't you curious for your children and your grandchildren, your nieces and your nephews? Are you not concerned about the allergic reactions and adverse effects that may bring about an unwanted rush to the emergency room or a call to the priest? Prominently listing these ingredients and possible adverse side effects is the essence of informed consent. It is neither an endorsement of nor a disendorsement of these life-saving vaccines. It is essentially public service. List the ingredients. Tell us what the stated and noted and observed adverse reactions are. In conclusion, telling us the ingredients conspicuously will not only serve the public, it will ultimately serve to enhance your credibility. It will prove that you know what you are talking about. It will prove that you have nothing to hide. It will prove that you care. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthew Sheffer, followed by Charlene Williams. <clears throat> Thank you, Matthew Sheffer. Live in six three zero six nine. I'm pastor at Church of the Word in Fenton, Missouri, uh, which is six three zero two six eight zero one Hawkins. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned. I've been getting phone calls about from, from people, medical professionals, concerned about loss of jobs and other people. Um, and it's amazing to me that, that people who have so much invested in education, so much financial investment in education, have jobs that they love, jobs that they dreamed of, jobs that they got into, many of them, because they wanted to help people. And they're willing to forego something they love to keep from taking a vaccine that A, violates their conscience. As stewards of the body that God has given them, they're convinced that it's bad for them. And, and B, it, it's a, a violation of their personal liberty. And uh, it's very concerning to me that in the people that are supposed to be the most educated about vaccines, that you would have people willing to go to such a loss, loss of finances in order to not take them. This is, this, is, this is amazing. I think it's a testimony to people that are up close to this disease. They're seeing it, and yet they should be the easiest to persuade 
if it if 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 it's just evidence alone can compel people, they should be the easiest to persuade, and yet they're not persuaded. I, I was looking up the definition of what a slave is. A slave is a person who is the legal property of another and is forced to obey them. Threatening people with the loss of their job, the loss of their livelihood, it's a form of blackmail. This is a moral evil. This is wrong. People are not the property of the state. We are free men and women in this country. To compel someone at the, thought of, at the threat of the loss of their job is an act of theft. It's not, it's not yours to give. It's not yours to take. And so I, I would just want to speak up for them tonight. You know, we, we were founded on the premise that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. Life, liberty, property. As a Christian, I know that these rights are inalienable because thou shalt not steal makes property inalienable. It's wrong for me as an individual to steal. It's wrong for the government to steal. It's wrong for me as an individual to murder. It's wrong for the government to murder. It's wrong for me as an individual to enslave a man. It's wrong for the government to enslave a man. So I would just, I would just greatly encourage you to, to rob a person of their choice, to say you must, at threat of loss of your job, your livelihood, what you love, you will lose your job if you do not take this vaccine, is an act of violence. It is a violent act. And even though you have legislative uh, uh, limited authority by our Constitution, just because something is legal does not make it right. A moral wrong is not right. So go back to persuading people rather than compelling Madam Chair, people that's by three minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Charlene Williams, followed by David Robertson. Charlene Williams, 63034. I'm speaking in favor of Bill 258, and this is a response to Greg Porter. Greg Porter stated that he was trying to go to CaseNet, but it was down. We must remember, and this is from Arthur Anthony J. D'Angelo, in order to succeed in a business, you must fail so that you know what to do next. I'm speaking concerning Chantel Nixon Clark. I'm here because I've worked with Chantel Nixon Clark in a variety of different type of spaces, from volunteerism, from also she's a cancer survivor. I started volunteering seven years ago because I lost two grandparents to cancer. So she was able to help me with resources as well as support. Also, as we, we with, with Chantel, excuse me, she has always been an upright individual in the community. A successful business owner, she currently has a business that's in Florida that will be down the street from the space that she's, the commercial space if approved. She also, doing the Mike Brown, she helped with police officers, giving them a safe space and feeding them. And she's always shown a good judgment and responsibility in every endeavor she pursues. So the same integrity and in the same integrity will be given to socially her and fluorescent, which will bring revenue and jobs and also help those youth as well as those that are needing employment. So as you decide, I ask that you please pass bill number 258. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Robertson, followed by Kim Landgriff. David Robertson, 63105. You know, I, I prepared this, what I thought was a beautiful speech about uh, religious liberty and how va vaccine mandates are unconstitutional, but some previous speakers, this is my first time speaking, but some previous speakers have just inspired me just to go off this script. So I'm just gonna talk about my situation. I, uh, I'm a Christian Zionist and as such, I've been one all my life. I don't um, take medication. I don't rely on, on, on medicine for healing. Um, and as a child growing up in Massachusetts, I had legal exemptions from all uh, vaccinations and all physical examinations. I work at the only Christian science college in the world lo located in Illinois. The governor of Illinois a couple weeks ago issued uh, an executive order. It requires all uh, students and faculty and staff at all universities, public and private in Illinois, to receive a vaccine uh, vaccination or to submit to weekly COVID testing. And so, uh, and very sadly, uh, well, 
I don't know that uh, my institution where I work, I think they'll just comply with that, but some of us at the school are uh, not complying with that. And basically I could lose my job, um, but I'm willing to do that because I don't believe the government can force you to take something like that. I, I wake up every day and I wonder, is this the country I grew up in, the 1980s? You know, like we had legal exemptions from these things and it's a fundamental violation of the First Amendment. And so why don't I just talk about that a bit? Uh, and I'm, we're all aware of this. The First Amendment uh, prohibits Congress from passing any law that inhibits the free exercise of, of religion. While it states Congress, the 14th Amendment and subsequent Supreme Court decisions have applied those protections, the Bill of Rights to individuals uh, at state and lo local government as well. So, I mean, basically what, any kind of local government that would force individuals to receive a a vac forced to have to get a vaccine or to submit to weekly COVID testing, if that violates their fundamental religious convictions, that's a violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Um, and I could also talk about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, but I won't. But we also hear about some, uh, about, uh, you know, these power, these emergency powers of governors and others in authority. When you're in an emergency, they some have a right to introduce state laws or constitutional rights and they don't and my question is if, if you start allowing that what kind where do you draw that line so they can violate your fundamental religious rights could they possibly gun down a group of people if they felt like it and not with impunity then we're basically a you know some kind of dictatorship so anyway i know that was kind of bouncing around but i just i'm really so disturbed about where our country is right now and i every day i wake up and i can't believe this is the United States of America, and I, I'm I'll maybe forced to lose my job because I don't want to take something into my body that I always had religious exemptions from previously. Madam Chair, that's three minutes. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Kim Landgraf, followed by John Bubb. Hi, Kim Landgraf, 63146. Um, I'm, going to go to, I'm going to start off with a little quote from ClancyForSTL.com, which I mentioned a few weeks ago, but I feel is important to mention again. Lisa has been a champion of Medicaid expansion, affordable quality early childhood education, fair wages, and paid parental leave, as well as your right to make the decisions about what happens to your body. Next, we move on to a direct quote from Kelly Dunaway. As a fierce advocate for choice, I am dedicated to protecting every person's essential freedom to make personal decisions about their own health and family. And in the words of Sam Page, every person has the right to reproductive health services and the freedom to control their own bodies, gender, sexuality, and live lives as they see fit. Any one of these three members who introduce and vote in favor of any legislation that limits a person's right to bodily autonomy such as mandatory masking or mandatory vaccination, is both a hypocrite and a liar. Should one of these three members or any member on this council who has ever advocated for my body, my choice, attempt to introduce any health legislation that infringes upon bodily autonomy, we the people demand that these individuals, sorry, from the, we the people demand from these individuals a full retraction of any statements referencing such claims and a public confession and apology to their constituents for knowingly misrepresenting their political platform. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Bubb, followed by Mark Clifton. I'm John Bubb, uh, 63026 inside of the uh, St. Louis County line. No sooner than the mask mandate with vaccine quotas issue disappears, than here comes the effort to manipulate private businesses to promote the same agenda. Many of the people who have been coming here in the last many weeks were suspicious of those bills, that those bills were dropped suddenly without apology and instead blaming the healthy for making the vaccinated sick. We knew it was not the end. The only question was what nonsense would be unleashed now? There are two sides here. One side wants to live their lives without being controlled, demeaned, robbed, or harassed by the other side. 
Their goal is to live productive, rewarding lives for which they must be healthy. We strive for health. The other side uses gaslighting, manipulation, 24-7 advertising and fear-mongering, silencing of dissenting opinions, deplatforming of established and reputable experts, slandering and ridicule of alternative options that have long been used safely and effectively by calling them dangerous and ineffective, financial and power incentives, false accusations of racism or violence, compulsion to make us take an injection of toxic garbage while exempting the manufacturer from liability. The manufacturer stands to make tens of billions and we are potentially left crippled, sterilized, or dead. But it's an emergency, a deadly disease, with a survival rate of 99.8%, they shriek. There are far bigger health threats, yet no big campaigns exist for them. The goal is control, and it does not matter what is the emergency du jour. The goal is not health of anyone. So who is controlling what? Well, it sure isn't us. Maybe instead, we can start, instead of laws imposing, may, maybe instead of laws imposing on us for some fantasy emergency, we need laws that constrain officials from violating we the people. Because, it, and we can start with that, okay? Because we are growing weary of this onslaught of nonsense. Our final speaker this evening, Madam Chair, is Mark Clifton. Yes, my name is Mark Clifton, 63026. I did not prepare, and it doesn't matter. If I take a vaccine that's safe and effective, then what do you all have to fear? I mean, what do I have to fear from you if you don't take a vaccine? And if it's not safe and effective, how can you ask me to take a vaccine? Simple as that. I took an oath to protect the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. You people, you're the domestic enemies, not you. You guys are all good. But Miss She Hers, <laughs> yeah, you. Hey, Sammy, with all due disrespect, you people have me angry, and it's not the first time. I woke up at 9-11, not going to get into that anymore. The fear, that's the enemy. The fear porn media. You turn off your TV, we solve COVID. It disappears. We're cured. Imagine that, we can go on and live our lives normally. No, let's just live in fear. Let's live in fear, right? I'll tell you what, you know, whenever somebody tells me to be safe, it makes me angry because you can't live safe. I can't get in my car and drive home if I'm going to live safe. It's ridiculous. Cars kill more people than this virus ever thought about, and the vaccine's killing more people than the virus it's probably doing anyway. We're not being told the truth, and definitely not by the media. By the way, you can watch this on uh, YouTube, St. Louis County Council meetings, until it disappears. I'm sick of this. The censorship, it's killing me. Um, I can't even get on Facebook anymore. I go to Facebook jail when I log on it. <laughs> it's crazy. You know why? Because I tell the truth. Every time I tell the truth, I get censored. I could say Superman's real, and guess what? They're not going to take me off. Jump off high buildings. They're okay with that. But no, I say COVID is fake. I'm gone. That's all I got to say. Thanks.
That's our final speaker, ma'am. That's our final speaker. Oh, okay. Well, thank you all very much for sharing your thoughts and concerns with us. It is important that we hear what you have to say, and believe you me, we are listening. So with that, I'll move on to the county executive's report. Good evening. I hope everyone had a good holiday weekend. While it has become a tradition to gather with family and friends to mark the end of summer, I don't want to get too far away from the holiday without thanking those who continue the fight for fair wages, safe working conditions, and avenues to jobs through workforce development programs. Prosperity should be within reach for all. I'm proud of the work of our, our St. Louis County employees. During this pandemic, they've stepped up to assure county government continues to operate and that services are provided at the level our residents have come to expect. Every department has to make adjustments to work safely and to keep the public from harm. Two of our department heads who have shown exemplary leadership during these challenging times are sadly leaving us. Doug Burris came out of retirement to become Director of Justice Services. We knew then we would be competing against the tug of him wanting to get back to his family and the rewards of relaxing after a stellar career as Chief Probation Officer for the Eastern District of Missouri. Under Doug's direction, the U.S. Probation Office became known around the country for its development and implementation of reentry programs that continue to reduce rates of supervised release violations, recidivism, and unemployment. Doug brought that innovation and passion with him to St. Louis County. He started culinary programs focusing on food safety and management with jobs lined up for each resident who completes those programs. He wrote letters to judges on behalf of Justice Center residents promoting their good behavior and strong work ethic. And Doug has also worked with the faith community to provide programming from anger management to parenting classes. His work alongside Justice Center employees has improved morale and he's gone to bat for them to enhance working conditions. And that includes his request to the council for pay raises for corrections officers. The work he did over a relatively short period of time will have a positive impact at the Justice Center for years to come. Scott Anders, Deputy Director of Administration, will serve as the interim until we have named a replacement for Doug. Andrew Jackson Jennings, a long-serving Director of Human Services, is leaving county government to become Managing Director of the Regional Response Team. Under AJ's leadership, the county social services arm for St. Louis County has ensured that our residents get the programs and services they deserve and that they can meet their most basic needs. AJ has been a great champion for our residents, especially during this pandemic, connect, connecting them to emergency rental assistance, utility assistance, food distribution events, and working with our community partners to provide as much help as possible during this very challenging time. AJ's work with the regional response team will allow her to work in the same space that she has for years, but with a larger reach. AJ has been a true partner in government, and I will miss having her as part of our team. We've begun a search for AJ's replacement and hope to have someone in place within a few weeks. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the county's recent recognition by the Government Finance Officers Association. The county's Office of Performance Management and Budget received the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. We have received this award each year since 2006. The award reflects the commitment of St. Louis County to meet the highest principles of government budgeting. According to the 21,000 member association, award recipients have pioneered efforts to improve the quality of budgeting and provide an excellent example for other governments throughout North America. Thank you to Paul Kreidler and his team for your continued work on creating a budget that presents a clear understanding of the county's finances. I know the last 18 months have not been easy for our employees across the county, but please know that we appreciate all of your hard work and coming up with innovative ways to serve the public during this pandemic. Many of these changes will remain in place, creating a more efficient, flexible, and safe work environment that ultimately improves services to our residents. That's all I have for now. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Moving on to introduction of bills. Bill number 263 introduced by council member days an ordinance authorizing the county executive to accept a grant from the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development appropriating the same pursuant to participation of Department of Justice Services in the apprenticeship state expansion program and authorizing the county executive and the director of the Department of Justice Services to execute necessary documents. <clears throat> Bill number 264 introduced by council member Dunaway an ordinance authorizing the county executive to grant a 10 year access and testing permit to Perkin Elmer Incorporated for the purpose of groundwater sampling in Martin Luther King Jr. Park and authorizing the county executive and the director of the Department of Parks and Recreation to execute additional necessary documents. Bill number 265 introduced by council member Fitch for council member Harder, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute a right of entry agreement with the United States of America for Lone Elk Park and authorizing the county executive and the director of the Department of Parks and Recreation to execute additional necessary documents. Bill number 266 introduced by council member Fitch for council member Harder, an ordinance authorizing the county executive to accept coronavirus response and relief supplemental appropriations act grant funds in an amount of up to $57,000 from the federal aviation administration, appropriating the same for support of airport enterprise fund operating costs and authorizing the county executive and the director of aviation to execute necessary documents. Bill number 267 introduced by council member Dunaway an ordinance amending ordinance number 27,741 by repealing and reenacting section one pertaining to the opening, widening and establishing of a section of public road designated as Dealman Road from Olive Boulevard to Page Avenue lying within the city of Olivet, the city of Overland and unincorporated St. Louis County, Missouri, AR-1554. Bill number 268 introduced by council members Dunaway, Fitch, Webb and Fitch for Harder an ordinance authorizing the county executive to execute a contract with Horner and Schifrin Incorporated for engineering services related to replacement of seven culverts and authorizing the director of the Department of Transportation and Public Works to execute necessary documents and revise the schedule of work activities as necessary. CR-1656, CR-1779, CR-1780, CR-1782, CR-1778, CR-1781 and CR-1777. Bill number 269 introduced by council member Days, an ordinance authorizing the county executive and director of administration to execute necessary documents to amend St. Louis County's deferred compensation plan. Madam Chair, that is all the bills. Thank you very much. Moving on to perfection. Bill number 32 introduced by council member Trakis. Move to hold bill number 32, please. Bill number 32 is held. Bill number 75 introduced by council member Dunaway. Um, before I make a motion, I would ask Madam Chair that we please schedule a committee of the whole so that we can move this along or get it off the agenda. And with that, I move to hold bill number 75. Bill number 75 is held. Substitute bill number one for bill number 77 introduced by council member Clancy. Please hold substitute bill number one for bill number 77. Substitute bill number one for bill number 77 is held. Substitute, substitute bill number one for bill number 88 introduced by council member Clancy. Yes, I'm gonna hold this bill again tonight, but I would like everyone to review this bill and let me know what questions you have. I would like to um, pick this back up and get it moving soon um, at the request of the the chair of the Commission on Human Relations. Thank you. So with that, I will move to hold substitute bill number one for bill number 88. 88, thank you. Bill, substitute bill number one for bill number 88 is held. Bill number 156 introduced by council member Clancy. Please hold bill number 156. Bill number 156 is held. Bill number 201 introduced by council member Days. I move to hold bill number 201. Bill number 201 is held. Bill number 228 introduced by council member Webb. I move to hold the committee of the whole meeting today where uh, the council heard from heard from medical professionals and we requested feedback from the county council's office so i will hold this bill until we receive that feedback 
and we would like to move forward on next season. So, county council is also going to need their feedback. Okay, I know. So we'll hold for one more week. Uh, bill number 228 is held. Bill number 251 introduced by council member days. I move to perfect bill number 251. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 No motion carries. Bill number 251 is perfected. Bill number 252 introduced by council member days. I move to perfect bill number 252. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Close no. Mo motion carries. Bill number 252 is perfected. Bill number 253 introduced by council member days. I move to perfect bill number 253. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Bill number 253 is perfected. Bill number 254 introduced by council member days. I move to perfect bill number 254. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Bill number 254 is perfected. Bill number 255 introduced by Council Member Harder. I'd like to take that up for Councilman Harder. I move to perfect bill number 255. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 No. Motion carries. Bill number 255 is perfected. Bill number 256 introduced by Council Member Fitch. I move to perfect bill number 256. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no motion carries. Bill number 256 is perfected. Bill number 257 introduced by council member Fitch. I move to perfect bill 257. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. No motion carries. Bill number 257 is perfected. Bill number 258 introduced by council member Webb. I move to perfect bill number 258. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 As opposed, no. Motion carries. Bill number 258 is perfected. Bill number 259 introduced by council member Trakis. Move to perfect bill number 259. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Bill number 259 is perfected. Bill number 260 introduced by council member Trakis. Move to perfect bill number 260. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, opposed, no. Motion carries. Bill number 260 is perfected. Bill number 261 introduced by council member Days. I move to hold. Wait a minute. Oh, I move to perfect bill number 261. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Let me back that up, please. Let me back that up one second. I need to hold bill 261. I apologize for that. Bill number 261 is held. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I would like to request a committee of the whole on this bill. On 261? Yes, please. We will have a committee of the whole on bill 261. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One moment, Madam Chair. Sure. Bill number 262 introduced by council member days. I move to hold bill number 262. Bill number 262 is held. Moving on to final passage. moment madam chair final passage bill number 320 introduced by council member clancy please hold bill number 320 bill number 320 is held bill number 14 introduced by council members trachis days dunaway fitch walton gray clancy and harder move to hold bill number 14 please bill number 14 is held Substitute bill number one for bill number 76 introduced by council members Dunaway and Harder. I move to hold substitute bill number one for bill number 76. Substitute bill number one for bill number 76 is held. Bill number 204 introduced by council member Days. I move to hold bill 204. Bill 204 is held. Substitute bill number one for bill number 239 introduced by council member Days. I move for final passage of substitute bill num bill one for bill number 239. Is there a second? Second. second. Roll call, please. 
Council Member Clancy? Aye. Council Member Fitch? No. Council Member Days? Aye. Council Member Harder? Sorry. Council Member Trakis? Nay. Council Member Webb? Aye. Council Member Dunaway? Aye. Madam Chair, did you get the? Just no. came through. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. On substitute bill number one for bill number two three nine, there are four ayes, two noes, and one absent. Madam Chair, bill, just one second. Substitute bill number one for bill number two thirty nine is finally passed. Councilman Trakus. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to note uh, for the clerk's purposes, I hit the wrong tab on the uh, vote for this and. It shows my vote as um, yes, and it should be no. I've changed it to a uh, vote against, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you, very Thank much. you Madam Chair. Thank you. Did you call that, Madam Chair? I'm sorry. Yes, I did. Okay. I it's finally passed. Yes. Thank you. I thought I did. Bill number 243 introduced by Council Member I move for final passage of bill number 243. Is there a second? second. Roll call, please. Council Member Clancy? Aye. Council Member Fitch? Aye. Council Member Days? Aye. Council Member Harder? Council Member Trakis? Aye. Council Member Webb? Aye. Council Member Dunaway? Aye. Madam Chair, on bill number 243, there are six ayes and one absent. Bill number 243 is finally passed. Bill number 244, introduced by Council Member Days. I move for final passage of bill number 244. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Clancy? Aye. Council Member Fitch? Aye. Council Member Days? Aye. Council Member Harder? Council Member Trakis? Aye. Council Member Webb? Aye. Council Member Dunaway? Aye. Madam Chair, on Bill Number 244, there are six ayes and one absent. Bill Number 244 is finally passed. Madam Chair? Councilman Fitch? For scoring purposes, I think. I was the second on that one. Oh, sorry about that. It's been changed, sir. Bill number 245 introduced by Council Member Days. I move for final passage of bill number 245. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Clancy? Aye. Council Member Fitch? Aye. Council Member Days? Aye. Council Member Harder? Council Member Trakis? Aye. Council Member Webb? Aye. Council Member Dunaway? Aye. Madam Chair, on Bill Number 245, there are six ayes and one absent. Bill Number 245 is finally passed. One moment. Madam Chair, Bill Number Two Four Six introduced by Council Member Day. I move for final passage of Bill Number Two Four Six. Is there a second? Second. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Clancy. Aye. Council Member Fitch. Aye. Council Member Days. Aye. Council Member Harder. Council Member Trakis. Aye. Council Member Webb. Aye. Council Member Dunaway. Aye. Madam Chair, on Bill Number 246, there are six ayes and one absent. Bill Number 246 is finally passed. Bill Number 247, introduced by Council Member Days. I move for final passage of Bill Number 247. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Clancy? Aye. Council Member Fitch? Aye. Council Member Days? Aye. Council Member Harder? Council Member Trakis? Aye. Council Member Webb? Aye. Council Member Dunaway? Aye. 
Madam Chair, on bill number 247, there are six ayes and one absent. Bill number 247 is finally passed. Bill number 248, introduced by Council Member Harder. I'd like to take that up for Councilman Harder. I move for final passage of bill number 248. Is there a second? Second. Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Clancy. Aye. Council Member Fitch. Aye. Council Member Days. Aye. Council Member Harder. Council Member Trakis. Aye. Council Member Webb. Aye. Council Member Dunaway. Aye. Madam Chair, on bill number 248, there are six ayes and one absent. Bill number 248 is finally passed. Bill number 249, introduced by Council Member Days. I move for final passage of bill number 249. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Clancy. Aye. Council Member Fitch. Aye. Council Member Days. Aye. Council Member Harder. Council Member Trakis. Aye. Council Member Webb. Aye. Council Member Dunaway. Aye. Madam Chair, on bill number 249, there are six ayes and one absent. Bill number 249 is finally passed. Bill number 250, introduced by Council Member Days. I move for final passage of bill number 250. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Clancy. Aye. Council Member Fitch. Aye. Council Member Days. Aye. Council Member Harder. Council Member Trakis. Aye. Council Member Webb. Aye. Council Member Dunaway. Aye. Madam Chair, on bill number 250, there are six ayes and one absent. Bill number 250 is finally passed. Do we have any resolutions this evening? No, Madam Chair, we do not. We will be moving on to unfinished business. Under unfinished business, Madam Chair, item number one. Please hold on the order of business, and that will be the order. Item number two. Please hold on the order of business, and that will be the that will be the order. Item number three. Please hold on the order of business, and that will be the order as well. Item number four. Please hold on the order of business, and that will be the order. Item number five. Please hold on the order of business, and that will be the order. Item number six. Please hold on the order of business and that will be the order. Item number seven. Same motion and that will be the order. Moving on to new business, Madam Chair, we have four prepared orders this evening. Prepared order number one in the matter of the request of the acting records manager for permission to destroy certain books, papers, and records of the Department of Administration Division of Fiscal Management. I move for the adoption of order number one. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 There is no motion carries. Order number one is adopted. Order number two this evening in the matter of communication from Greg Tater, Director of Procurement, and Jennifer Keating, Acting Director of Administration, requesting authorization to dispose of certain personal property. I move for the adoption of order number two. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Order number two, motion carries. Order number two is adopted. One moment, Madam Chair. Pardon me, Madam Chair. Prepared order number three this evening in the matter of the Director of Revenue's request to transfer all interest in certain real estate bought by him as trustee at the collector's 2008 tax sale. Move for the adoption of order number three. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Because no motion carries. Order number three is adopted. In our final prepared order this evening, Madam Chair, prepared order number four in the matter of the selection of an investment agent for the County Employees Retirement Fund. I move for the adoption of order number four. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion, motion carries. Order number four is adopted. 
Any other matters to come before the body this evening? Any announcements? Madam Chair. Councilman Chakas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just um, want to thank the chair personally. Um, as you know, I sent you a letter this week concerning Bill 201, reiterating my request that we have a committee of the whole. And um, my understanding is that you intend to hold one. I really appreciate that. I think it's an important measure. It's important that um, we hear from the Convention of Visitors Bureau with respect to the substance of their plans. So I thank you for um, agreeing to schedule. I know we have a lot going on right now, so I don't want to say that we have to have it immediately, but um, perhaps sometime next month. If we get through it, that would be great. Thank you very much, Councilman Trickett. You're so welcome. Any other Thank business you. to come before the uh, uh, Councilman Figg? Just one announcement. I will be working out of town next Tuesday, so I will attend remotely. Thank you. Any, any further um, announcements? Madam Chair. Councilman Webb. Yes, I will be at Hazelwood Central High School in the parking lot at 9 a.m. For those who want to join me, I am continuing to uh, canvas the neighborhood. I'm in Spanish Lake now. We will meet there and then we'll go on and knock on doors for vaccination. Thank you, ma'am. Certainly. Any other business to come before the body at this time? Motion to adjourn. So Second. 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 Please say aye. 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 No. Motion carries.